Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. Um, <clears throat> today's uh, webinar is on uh, the impact of opioids in Indian country. And um, I'm Puneet Sahota, the Director of Research at uh, the National Indian Child Welfare Association. Um, so uh, at the end of the webinar, um, you know, please do stay on for the, the survey. We really appreciate the feedback. Um, today I'm hoping to give you an introduction uh, to this topic, and um, I'm sure there will be uh, a lot of uh, questions and experiences that people have, and so, um, you know, if we're not able to get to everything, I just would like to say that I'll reach out um, after the webinar as well with any answers or information that I can help to provide. Um, <clears throat> So just go ahead and get started. So I already mentioned this webinar is being hosted uh, by NICWA, by the National Indian Child Welfare Association, um, as part of our work with the National uh, TA Network for Children's Behavioral Health. Um, and I guess that before I start talking um, in more detail about um, the opioid epidemic. Um, I would like to just uh, briefly introduce myself. I know some of you just from our work together um, with the Systems of Care um, grantee technical assistance effort. Um, but for those who I don't know, um, I'm Puneet Sahota. I'm a practicing psychiatrist. Um, and so that's the medical half of my training. And then um, with NICWA, I help to support our research program um, and uh, have been um, supporting the systems of care technical assistance work now for two years. Um, so we chose this topic today on the opioid epidemic because we've been hearing from many of our um, tribal grantee communities about this and about the challenges it poses. And so today will be kind of an introduction to issues in Indian country, um, but we'll have follow-up on this as well in the future. Um, so opioid misuse, as I'm sure many of you know, is um, a critical public health issue. Um, and overdose deaths are now the leading cause of accidental death uh, in the United States. More than six out of 10 of drug overdose deaths um, in the general US population do involve opioids. Um, and from 2000 to 2015, um, over half a million people died from overdoses in the US. So as far as what are opioids, um, they include both um, illegal drugs like heroin, but also um, prescription medications, um, commonly used for pain, like Percocet, Vicodin, Oxycontin, uh, morphine, and others. Um, and prescription medication misuse is a major cause of the opioid crisis. Um, and so in the case of youth, they can access prescription medications that are prescribed to others in their family um, or access those medications sometimes from their peers. Um, as far as opioids and child welfare, um, the misuse of opioids and other substances can be um, a factor leading to a family's involvement in child welfare. Um, in Indian country, the majority of child welfare involved families um, do have some kind of substance use challenge that's part of the picture. Um, and we've seen that in terms of prior NICWA research and work. Exposure to opioid misuse during pregnancy um, is particularly dangerous um, for both the baby and the mother. Um, however, it's important to support our, um, our pregnant women um, that are dealing with opioids and um, tell them not to stop using opioids all of a sudden. They need medication-assisted treatment. Um, because withdrawal from opioids is, um, is, is definitely uncomfortable for um, the pregnant woman, but it can be fatal for the baby. And so there needs to be a careful 
weaning off of the opioids to um, prevent the withdrawal. And so uh, mothers need treatment um, during pregnancy for opioid misuse problems. Babies who are exposed to opioids during pregnancy can develop neonatal abstinence syndrome, which is a result of having withdrawal. Um, and some of the signs of neonatal abstinence syndrome, or NAS, are breathing problems, seizures, um, fevers, difficulty with sleeping, hyperactivity, um, having problems coordinating um, a good suck and swallow for feeding, um, irritability, excessive crying, and then problems um, with feeding and digestion. Um, and as far as the, the research on um, child development and exposure to opioids um, in pregnancy, um, the long-term effects on child development are not known. Um, so those are some of the, the general considerations to think about related to opioids and child welfare. Um, in Indian country, the data we have are limited, but we wanted to share with you the information that we do have. Um, American Indian and Alaska Native people have the highest drug overdose rate of any ethnic group. Um, and that problem got uh, worse from 1999 to 2008. Um, the age-adjusted death rate during that time more than doubled from drug overdose. But in terms of uh, data specific to opioids, um, that data is limited. Um, there are some regional and local data available, and um, we'll be talking a little bit about that. Um, and so there uh, was a study um, conducted from uh, a Midwest reservation with American Indian Alaska Native adults. Um, and that study reported um, the respondents to that study, 30% of them reported um, that they had used Oxycontin that was not prescribed to them during their lifetime. 19% um, had used it in the last year and 13% in the past month. So even though this is a study from one specific um, community, we just thought it was helpful to share some ballpark uh, numbers to give you a sense, um, although it's not representative of Indian country as a whole. Um, in that study, young adults were the most likely to report having used OxyContin, and non-medical use among them was two and a half times higher than the same age group in the general population. Um, so there are also some um, qualitative research studies about opioid use in Indian country. Um, and these um, focus group and interview studies um, are really helpful because they give us a sense of um, why people are using and some of the context. Um, what the greatest concerns are that community members have. Um, and so um, the two studies that are um, on the bottom of this slide in that parentheses, both of those were um, focus group studies and on two, in two different um, geographic areas. And that showed that community members were more concerned about the use of OxyContin um, or of opioids than any other substance. They were more worried about that in their community. They thought it was a bigger problem in their community than any other substance, um, including marijuana and alcohol. Um, and the main source of OxyContin, so you know, the focus group study also helps us understand where it comes from. The main sources were um, from healthcare providers or buying pills from individuals that were prescribed them. Um, and there were some concerns um, that community members expressed about elders um, potentially being vulnerable, that elders who were, take, who were prescribed um, opioid medications might have those medicines stolen, um, or that money was being stolen from elders by individuals who um, might have an opioid use problem. Um, 
and another factor that came up in this study was that elderly and disabled community members um, were uh, selling part of their prescription supply um, in order to supplement their own limited income. Um, so I know uh, all of you who are um, Tribal Systems of Care grantees um, know this from your experience working in your communities. Um, historic trauma is a major factor in terms of um, misuse of opioids and a major contributor to substance use in Indian country. Um, and so in some of the focus group studies we looked at, um, Native participants were saying that opioid drugs were used by other people in their community to self-medicate, either to self-medicate um, negative feelings or challenging emotions they were dealing with, um, or to fill an emotional void, like if um, you know they had uh, a sense of emptiness that sometimes opioids were used for that. And historic trauma, um, as well as you know, intergenerational trauma, absolutely contributes to those um, feelings of numbness or feeling empty, um, feeling not grounded and not, um, you know, not deeply connected to one's identity and community. So, um, you know, at NICWA, we just think it's important to acknowledge the aspects of historic trauma that um, come up here, not just for opioids, but for all substance use. So um, that's what we, what we heard from uh, community members that were interviewed in these studies. Um, so as far as what are communities doing and what, what can they do to manage opioid misuse, um, there are a number of examples of um, tribal communities that are doing really innovative things. Um, one tribe has declared a public health emergency as a way to marshal resources, um, and culturally-based strategies are really important, um, especially just in light of the, of the historic trauma. Uh, contribution. So um, we'll just review some of the potential steps now that communities can take to address the opioid epidemic. Um, tribal child welfare and mental health program staff can screen for opioid misuse. So, um, and that just means asking about it and asking um, parents, caregivers, um, family members involved about whether this is an issue. Um, and we talked a bit earlier about um, young uh, pregnant women. Asking pregnant mothers um, about opioid use or prescription drug use is really important to prevent problems for their babies. At the same time, um, pregnant women may be scared to disclose that they're using opioids um, because they may be afraid of their children being taken. Um, and so it can be helpful to have a, a strategy ahead of time for how to, um, how to let a woman and her family know that the goal is to help and the goal is to um, help the, the baby have um, good development rather than to um, take the child away. And so any kind of screening or um, interviewing people about potential opioid use needs to be within a context of support and within a context of, you know, letting them know they're not going to be um, criminalized or arrested or punished, things like that, but rather that the goal is to help them um, and not to blame them. Um, because really with historic trauma being such a big contributor to this and poor access to care in a lot of uh, places, we don't want individuals to feel even less uh, willing to come forward just because of the potential issues that could happen for the baby down the line. Um, so that's just a, a, a broader concern in terms of pregnancy. Um, there's also been some recent research showing that women who are using substances during pregnancy 
um, are more likely to isolate themselves from their families and their support network, and they're also more likely to avoid prenatal care because they're scared of being um, detected and are afraid of those other things we were talking about, like losing their children. Um, and so, you know, that, that poses a barrier here, but whatever uh, can be done to build trust and <clears throat> um, to coordinate between child welfare and healthcare providers, um, that's really the best practice we would recommend. And there are some tribes where they have actually um, co-located prenatal care um, and uh, substance use services so that a woman who's pregnant can come even with her children. They, there's also some places with um, on-site childcare or on-site um, resources for children so that a, a mother can come, bring her children, get treated um, for substance use, and get her pregnancy care all in the same place. Um, and in those um, best practices, there's also a cultural component to the care. And so those are the kind of, of innovative things that communities um, are doing that can be helpful. Um, so just wanted to talk um, a bit about medication-assisted uh, treatment. Um, so there's been um, extensive research showing that um, the most effective treatment for opioid misuse problems is medication-assisted. And so some of the uh, medications most commonly used are um, Suboxone or Methadone. Um, and these medicines can be given to help prevent opioid um, use and gradually decreased and stopped over time. And that's true um, in pregnancy, um, that a woman can take um, opioid replacement therapy, um, a medication, and gradually wean off of it, and that's much safer um, than stopping using all of a sudden, just in terms of the withdrawal for the baby. Um, without any medication, um, like methadone or suboxone, um, the risk of overdose is very high. Um, because often what, what, what will happen is an individual who's using opioids will stop using them suddenly, um, go through withdrawal, and then if they have some time that they're drug-free, um, their body changes its tolerance. And so um, they need much less of the drug to get high, but then if they take the same amount they used to take um, before quitting, they can end up unintentionally overdosing um, because one of the effects of opioids is to decrease breathing. Um, and so it's um, unintentional overdose death that's, um, that's the risk. So sometimes we hear um, from people that they don't want to take a medication because they'll say, well, it's just replacing one addiction for another. I don't want to take anything. Um, but opioids really are different in terms of how they work um, biologically compared to other substances that people use, um, like marijuana, cocaine, meth, alcohol, things like that. Um, the, the difference with opioids is that the way they work in the brain is that they, um, they're really one of the most addictive substances, and it's, it's not a matter of willpower on the part of the individual. It's just that the brain and body chemistry changes significantly when someone's been taking opioids. And um, so without medication replacement therapy, the risk of relapse, um, just meaning that somebody might start using again, is over 90% um, in a year on opioids. And so medication-assisted treatment really um, is the standard of care. and you know, we, we just try to, in my clinic anyway, we try to share with people that, um, you know, our goal is to support them in making whatever um, lifestyle changes or support changes they need to um, so they can eventually taper off. And so our goal is not to keep, keep taking these medicines forever, but we do want to give people some time to wean off gradually because the... Um, the rates of success are a lot higher that way. So in terms of, of accessing um, these medications, like um, Suboxone and Methadone, um, that can be challenging in some geographic areas. Um, 
it does require a prescriber with a special license. Um, and so community members and tribal staff can encourage um, their local healthcare systems to either hire providers or to um, contract with those who have a license to prescribe Suboxone or Methadone. Um, so that's, um, that's uh, uh, one thing to note. And um, I'm, I'm just having a look at the public chat box. Thank you, Jacob, for bringing up the MOMS program at White Earth. Um, that was the program I was describing earlier um, when I was talking about one of the best practice programs where they provide pregnancy care and substance use care um, and support for children all in the same place as well as culturally based strategies. So the MOMS program is a very innovative program for treating opioid misuse, very culturally um, based, and I agree that that's a terrific resource. Um, and I can um, share a link about that um, at the end of the presentation. Um, so in terms of the um, medication side of things, um, we've already talked about um, medication-assisted treatment just to help people eventually stop using. Um, and then the, thank you, Jacob, there's the link for the MOMS program for anyone who's interested. It's in the public chat. Um, and then the other side of medication treatment is to help reverse overdose. So um, naloxone, which is a drug that reverses the effects of opioids, can be given to help prevent death. Um, and in many tribal communities, there's been an effort to really train people broadly in how to use naloxone. Um, so emergency responders, community members, um, tribal staff, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be a healthcare provider. So, you know, people in, um, in the family of somebody who's using opioids can also be trained in how to use naloxone um, just as a way to prevent overdose deaths so that if someone is found unresponsive, they can be treated with uh, naloxone. Um, the Indian Health Service and tribal health systems have been distributing naloxone more widely um, and providing training in its use recently as a way to address the opioid epidemic. And at NICWA, we, um, we always talk about the importance of partnership with cultural and spiritual leaders, culturally based treatment, um, as well as prevention programs that are culturally based can help to improve a sense of self-esteem and, and personal strength in individuals. Um, and that may address some of the reasons that people use um, that we were talking about before, like um, self-medication for trauma, um, either historic trauma, intergenerational trauma, or individual trauma that people have experienced. Um, and I will say that um, you may notice throughout these slides that we've used um, the term opioid misuse, and we're not using the term opioid abuse or opioid dependence. Um, and the reason for that is just um, that this, um, this problem, this opioid um, epidemic, really is um, widespread and very painful for people who are dealing with it. And we don't want to stigmatize them even more. Um, and so that's why we've, um, we've tried to be careful about the language we're using in this presentation and in other NICWA materials um, about opioids in Indian country. So that's just, just a side note. Um, and so these are the, some of the references um, from the slides. These are some of the papers that we talked about and um, the qualitative papers are, are here. There's also information about medication assisted treatments. Um, and so I know we've got um, a good amount of time left. And I, I also know that, um, that some of the, um, the people on the call here have their own experiences within their communities. And we would love to hear from you and to hear your collective wisdom 
Um, I see one comment from David saying that some of the first responders are getting away from the term overdose and are using poisoning instead, and I really appreciate that feedback. Thank you. That's exactly the kind of um, effort we're trying to make in terms of the language that we use as well. So we will definitely uh, take that under uh, consideration at NICWA too in our materials. Um, so um, I think it would be great if we could unmute um, the lines so that people can um, contribute to the discussion and talk with one another. And um, if you do have any questions, we would be happy to address those, but we definitely want to hear your experiences with opioids and child welfare. And uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, and when people are, are not speaking, if you could please mute your own phone, that would help to prevent um, feedback and echoing. Um, but if anyone would like to share, we would love to hear from you. Your lines are now unmuted. Jacob, I'm wondering, Jacob Davis, if you're on the line, I'm wondering, would you like to talk at all about the MOMS program? Um, yeah, I could provide uh, a little context, I guess. I know uh, Jerry Jaskin and Julie Williams. Uh, Julie Williams is the director of the MOMS program. Um, they were very unique, unique in how they set it up, and I'm not sure if they have any. we have anybody on the phone from White Earth that would like to talk, um, but I could provide um, some context as to how they, they originally started, um, and it was through community conversations and some of their tribal meetings. And there's a real push because they saw um, the abuse problem, I guess, within their community, uh, our misuse problem within their community, and they wanted to address it. Uh, and um, so <laughs> the MOMS program was developed before they actually had some of the policies firmly in place. And so it was really symbiotic um, with multiple systems working together to really approach it from a holistic way are in a holistic way, which uh, that's what makes it such a great program is it had plenty of community support um, and they've gotten to the point now, they've only been in existence a couple of years, but they've gotten to the point where they're uh, sustainable and they actually have people coming in off the street to sign up for service that, services that aren't referred through their wellness court and they treat, um, uh, they treat it as a disease and they're changing the stigma of how people react to those types of conversations when you're talking about um, substance abuse or substance misuse or substance disorders and are treating it like the disease it is to where the community perspective and dynamic on how they approach that is, is changing as well. So it's really exciting and wonderful to see. Um, so I would recommend anybody that, that's looking at a program that has had success that they reach out. And then I also shared a resource I was coming across. Uh, I work with two tribes. I'm a tribal programming director for the maternal infant and early childhood home visiting program that's run through um, Prevent Child Use North Dakota. Uh, so we work with two tribal sites in North Dakota, Turtle Mountain, Spirit Lake. And so we're looking at developing similar programs within those two communities uh, due to the problems that exist within them right now surrounding opioid misuse. So, so sorry, so I, I, think I, I think I got off, yeah, I think I got off topic. I was just going to tell you that I shared a research about what's being done in the state of uh, Michigan because I used to live there. And mm -hmm. so they're having some success because they're working more at the state level and trying to collaborate with the tribes to address the issue um, from that perspective. Thank you. Would anyone else like to share about their experiences or knowledge of how um, opioid use is being addressed by communities? David, would you like to talk a bit about the comment you added to the chat box 
on first responders and some of the um, the ways that they're talking about this issue? Uh, sure. Um, really, this came to, uh, to my attention in terms of the change when I went to a training done by one of our detectives with Fort Wayne Police Department. Um, very compassionate presentation about drug uh, use. And the reason they were trying to get away from saying overdose and getting it more toward a poisoning aspect was twofold. One, to make it more of a medical issue rather than a, oh, the person's a drug addict, they're weak, they're whatever, blah, blah, blah. Um, but then also because we have had problems, as I'm sure others have had, where um, methadone, or not methadone, but <laughs> sorry, um, Opio opioids, uh, both like uh, prescription and non-prescription and the street kind, are getting mixed with all sorts of stuff. Um, we have a real problem right now with um, heroin being mixed with, uh, with essentially an elephant tranquilizer. And um, it's killing people, unfortunately. Um, the other day, we actually at the park, one of our city parks, we had three poisonings in one day. Um, that had to be uh, brought back and, and, and then treated. Um, so really trying to get away from this whole blaming thing to where it's a medical model where you're just dealing with a poisoning like it would be if somebody drank some what they thought was whiskey and turned out to be like, you know, wood ethanol or something like that. Um, so I mean, that's really sort of the goal is, is to help with that treatment issue but then also then it opens it up to where people can call and say, look, my friend's been poisoned rather than, hey, my friend's overdosed. Um, there seems to be a, that, that stigma change seems to help. Um, this is all anecdotal, by the way. I don't think they've done any surveys yet on how it actually affects and having data and numbers, but it is it seems to be happening um, just by word of mouth and then what's happening with our, especially folks that are severely at risk for drug abuse um, and addictions. Uh, you know, our folks that are homeless or folks that have mental health issues on top of that. Um, so anyway, that's kind of where it came from, and that's hopefully the direction we're headed to. Thank you. Are there others who might like to share? Any of the systems of care grantees have experience with this? I know, I know, Joellen, you're on the line from Mescalero. I was wondering if that was something that um, you all had been dealing with. Or others don't want to, you know, don't want to put anybody on the spot or anything. Or if there are any questions that people have, would be happy to try and answer those as well. It looks like we have a question in the chat box um, from Jim Pete. Um, I'm going to let you finish typing, Jim, and then I'll, I'll try to answer. Looks like you're, you're still uh, entering the question. So in, in terms of um, funding for the opioid crisis, um, one of, the, one of the challenges, I think, in getting funding is that the recent legislation passed uh, by Congress did not include tribes um, as, as direct recipients of funding. Um, there was funding for all 50 states. Um, SAMHSA did give um, guidance as part of that legislation saying that states should be consulting um, with, with tribes um, in their area. And so, um, you know, NICWA has uh, advocated to SAMHSA um, and other federal funders for the 
importance in the future of funding for opioids being directly available to tribes. Um, but at this point, um, some of the funding that is available through the 21st Century uh, Cures Act um, is accessed through states, and so tribes can work with their state um, or states uh, on that. Um, and the, the question around funding more specifically from, from Jim is um, in terms of looking for funding to assist with this issue, are numbers a major factor in determining allocations? So, you know, for, for a, a community that has one or two, and I, I'm guessing that you meant one or two uh, deaths or other, um, other negative consequences. So is it like the number of people harmed or the, the number, right, so the number of people harmed or the number of people who've experienced it. Um, to my knowledge, the funding available through the 20th, 21st Century Cures Act um, was not specifically related to uh, numbers, but whenever there's competitive grant funding in the future, um, you know, it's possible that um, the data collected from given communities might be used in making some of those decisions. Um, but right now, the federal government has um, offered this funding to all 50 states. Any other uh, questions or experiences people might want to share? If not, we can definitely end early on this Friday. <laughs> And there's some other resources in the chat box that um, Jacob is very helpfully sharing. So if anyone would like access to those, please feel free to visit those. I'm wondering, are, are we able to put together a list of these resources to send out after the webinar is over? Okay, yes, so we, we, will, um, we will assemble some of these resources for all of you and we'll share them with you um, after the webinar is over as well. So uh, before we wrap up, just want to say again um, that we would really appreciate your feedback. And um, so there's a link for the survey in um, in the chat box for you there. And that's just a, a survey about the presentation today. And we would really um, welcome your feedback and response to it. Um, we really appreciate your time. Let me just uh, see if there's any other announcements from the Institute. Are there any um, other announcements or closing remarks you all would like to make? Okay, so I think um, if anyone else has anything to share, um, we're happy to listen. Or if you'd like to reach out to us individually at NICWA, we'd be happy to talk to you offline as well uh, more about opioid use and how we can help. Um, this is my contact information. And so um, please feel free to email me anytime. And if, if I don't know the answer to a question, for you, I can definitely find out. Um, we've got a terrific team at NICWA with a lot of expertise. And uh, if I don't know how to access something or information you need, another member of our team definitely will. So hope everybody has a wonderful weekend. Um, and thank you so much for joining us. Have a great day.